Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 15B, which is hematology, erythrocytic diseases. We are streaming live from AMRI Hospital, Kolkata. And we have a very basic, very interesting and very relevant topic, which is clinical manifestations and classifications of erythrocyte disorders. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Kanika Gupta Podar. She is once again with us. And she is an MBBS from RG Card Medical College and MD Path from Medical College, Kolkata. Presently, she is a consultant, histopathologist and a hematopathologist at the very famous AMRI Hospital, Kolkata. Special expertise in bone marrow procedures. Areas of interest are histopathology and immunohistochemistry. Before I ask Madam to start, let me request all of you to keep your mic muted your camera off and please don't share your screen with this i would request uh, dr kanika ma'am please share your screen and Good let evening, us start sir. the show thank you so much so today we will discuss the clinical manifestations and and the basic classification of the erythrocytic disorders it is a very basic topic and we will just give you an overview of what you should read in the further in, in the entire erythrocytic disorders so it is a very basic class it is just a brush up class of, of what to expect in the erythrocytic disorders thing just press that arrow we'll be sharing your entire screen yeah fantastic now just share your powerpoint from the yes. taskbar double click and make it full screen from here only yes. from the lower part absolutely fine please start um, just i'll just take a minute yeah yeah please sure ma'am i'm in the middle of a lecture my husband is taking the class yes ma'am So we'll start with the clinical manifestations and classification of erythrocyte disorders. Hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Can you hear? Yes, yes, absolutely clear. Go ahead. So what are anemias? So anemias are decrease in red cell mass. And what is increase in red cell mass? It is the erythrocytosis. So we talk when we talk about the erythrocyte disorders, it is not only anemias, which is the decrease in red cell mass. It is also the erythrocytosis, which is the increase in the red cell mass. So these changes in the red cell mass, we infer from the hemoglobin concentration, usually in anemias and in erythrocytosis by also the hematocrit. The principal effect of anemia, that is the various clinical manifestations of anemia that we get is basically due to the two principles. That is the decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, which ultimately leads to tissue hypoxia. So once again, I repeat that the clinical manifestations of anemia are a function of decreased oxygen carrying capacity of blood and leading to varying degrees of tissue hypoxia. So the tissue hypoxia occurs when the pressure of oxygen in the capillaries is too low to provide cells with enough oxygen for their metabolic needs. So all this will remind you of our physiology classes in the first year MBBS. So this is that very basic concepts. We will again revise that. So in an average person, the red cell mass must provide the total body tissues with 0.25 liter per minute of oxygen to support life. This is the requirement of our tissues. That is a 0.25 liter per minute of oxygen. And the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is 1.34 milliliter per gram of hemoglobin. Also, we have been knowing that the cardiac output is 5 liter per minute. And with the that is 1 liter per minute of oxygen is available at the tissue level. So, extraction of one fourth of this amount reduces the oxygen tension to so when the blood flows through the capillaries one fourth of this, the hundred toss is in the pressure is in the arteries and there is extraction from hundred toss by the time it goes to the capillaries it is the 40 toss in the venous end this partial extraction ensures that there is sufficient diffusion pressure throughout the capillaries to provide all cells with sufficient oxygen for their metabolic needs 
in anemia what happens that the, when there is the same amount of oxygen it leads to greater hemoglobin desaturation and the oxygen tension at the capillary end is very low this leads to hypoxia and all the tissue in the vicinity of the capillaries are not able to get oxygenated so this is a schematic this is a diagrammatic representation of what is happening see so this is if this cone represents a tissue so this is the arterial end and this is the venous end so theoretically when a segment is provided with oxygen with the arterial diffusion pressure of oxygen of 100 torr and partial oxygen extraction when it is occurred so it when the venous oxygen it comes up to the venous side it is 40 torr so one capillary can provide oxygen to cells within this truncated segment but when there is less of hemoglobin so there is excessive extraction with complete oxygen extraction the oxygen is not supplied to this part of the tissues so hence there is tissue hypoxia so when this occurs our body will obviously try to compensate it will try to cope up so various compensatory mechanisms gets activated and these compensatory mechanisms will give us the clinical manifestations of anemia what are these compensatory mechanisms these are the activation of the hypoxia induced factor decreased oxygen consumption that is the tissue will consume less oxygen only also the oxygen affinity to the hemoglobin decrease this action permits increased extraction of the oxygen from the hemoglobin there is increased tissue perfusion how does that happen it occurs locally by changing the vasomotor activities in the capillaries and in the long term there is enhanced angiogenesis the heart will also act so the heart acts by increasing the cardiac output when the cardiac output increases it leads to tachycardia if the pulse rate increases there is increased arterial and capillary pulsation and in the extreme cases we get these flow murmurs in the heart the lungs will also start to activate more it will be more functional there will be increase in the respiratory rate there will be exertional dyspnea or thopnea these are the clinical manifestations in moderate to severe anemia also now the their body will try to cope up by increasing the red cell production by means of increasing the erythropoietin we all know erythropoietin is a hormone which mediates the production of red blood cells in the marrow so the changes in the erythropoietin level ensures that the rbc production increases this specially occurs in response to the hemolytic anemias and anemias due to blood loss if the anemia is mild it will be compensated and the, if iron is available then the repair will be uh, made up but then the excessive erythroid activity in the marrows it will expand the marrow spaces and another clinical manifestations of sternal tenderness and bone pain will occur also one is that the reticulocytes it is the marker of the erythrocyte production in the marrow so there will be reticulocytosis so now when the erythroid transit time through the marrow is shortened because the marrow is working more and more and there is premature release of the rbcs from the marrow so this will lead to release of the stress reticulocytes from the marrow the stress reticulocytes they have they have characteristic surface folds and that will be seen in the peripheral blood so the nrbcs will also be seen in the peripheral blood so the, uh, seeing the nrbcs in the peripheral blood is a marker of hemolytic anemia it is a marker of that the bone marrow is working excessively and there is premature release of the rbcs in the peripheral blood so some sort of a hemolytic process is carrying on when the tissue hypoxia is excessive when it is mild to moderate our body tries to compensate at the local level at the cardiac level at the lung level but when the tissue hypoxia is excessive we will get these symptoms because of the compensatory mechanisms so what are these symptoms as we discuss it is the dyspnea on exertion angina intermittent claudication muscle cramps get headache light headedness we can also get gi symptoms genito urinary symptoms like abdominal cramps nausea but <coughs> but whether these symptoms is attributed to local factors like tissue hypoxia or it is leading to compensatory redistribution of blood it is uncertain we cannot attribute it to a single pinpoint point all the factors in combination will give rise to these clinical manifestations so this is about the clinical manifestations and how they occur now how do we classify the erythrocytic disorders erythrocyte disorders are classified based on their red cell mass so it is absolute and relative so we have to know what is relative when it is actually relative is dhoka dena it is a spurious thing 
so it, the normal a normal red cell mass and there is an increase in plasma volume resulting in dilutional anemia so we are seeing that the hemoglobin is low but this hemoglobin low is not because of any rbc disorder it is due to the increased plasma cell volume this we have we have to be very careful and keep in mind also especially the clinicians as well as the pathologists who is reporting wherever we are seeing low hemoglobin we cannot always attribute it to uh, any sort of rbc disorders which we all usually tend to do in our daily practice we also need to see how is the plasma volume and the absolute causes of the red cell mass that is a decrease in red cell mass is the absolute cause so it now this absolute can be decreased production or it can be due to increased destruction subsequently the anemias are also classified as macrocytic normocytic and microcytic based on their rbc indices so mainly now we start with the classification of the anemia so we have read just now it is the absolute anemia that is the decreased red cell production it can be acquired or it can be hereditary so the acquired causes are pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell failure it can be due to autoimmune causes that is the drug induced radiation induced viruses anemias of leukemia and of myelodysplastic syndrome anemias associated with makes your little one creative anemia is associated with marrow infiltration post chemotherapy and it's quite progenitor cell failure this occurs learns all of these things with one coloring app it's possible with kidlo coloring in this app you will find awesome coloring activities for your child there are coloring pages that's so coloring I'll start with the absolute anemias again. So it is the absolute anemia decreased red cell volume. So when the decreased red cell volume can be due to decreased production or it can be due to increased production. We first classify that is the causes due to decreased red cell production. It can be acquired, it can be hereditary. From the acquired causes, first let's start with the bone marrow causes. So the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell failure. It starts from the bone marrow itself. That is number one is the aplastic anemia, drug induced, radiation induced. That is a marrow failure. It occurs due to marrow failure. We have also discussed this under the marrow failure syndromes, anemias of leukemia and of myelodysplastic syndromes. So the, when there is leukemia, MDS, it also suppresses the marrow, and subsequently there is destruction in the red blood cells. anemia is associated with marrow infiltration this is the myelophthisic anemia what happens is many epithelial malignancies when they infiltrate the marrows it leads to destruction decrease red cell production it suppresses the rbcs so this also leads to decrease rbc production also chemotherapy suppresses the marrow so these are the marrow causes pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell failure another marrow causes is specific to the erythroid progenitor cells that is the pure red cell aplasia this also i had discussed so this in pure red cell aplasia only the erythroid lineage cells is affected in many endocrine disorders they disturb the erythroid progenitor cells or it can be acquired sideroblastic anemia so we saw the bone marrow cause that is the destruction of the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells or the specific erythroid progenitor cells next is the functional impairment of the erythroid the, you, it can occur from nutritional causes and other causes so the functional impairment of the erythroid cells occurs due to megaloblastic anemia which can occur due to b12 deficiencies folic acid deficiencies drug induced another nutritional cause is the most common iron deficiency anemias anemia can also result from other nutritional deficiencies anemia of chronic disease chronic inflammation leads to anemia anemia of renal disorders absolute anemia do, now we come to the uh, hereditary causes again the hereditary causes we go over first to the bone marrow to the bone marrow it is a pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell failure the fanconi swashman syndrome dyskeratosis congenita we have discussed is in the bone marrow failure syndromes also again there are syndromes which specifically affect the erythroid progenitor cells the diamond blackfern syndromes congenital dyserythropoietic syndromes and there are hereditary causes of functional impairment of erythroid so we discuss the acquired causes of these three that is which disturbs the uh, pluripotent stem cells specifically the erythroid cells and the functional impairment so the functional impairment can also occur due to acquired uh, due to hereditary causes there are many megaloblastic anemia which occurs due to hereditary causes that is selective malabsorption of b12 
congenital intrinsic factor deficiency transcobalamin deficiency inborn errors of metabolism inborn errors of folate metabolism inborn purine and pyrimidine metabolism defects disorders in iron metabolism there are many hereditary causes hereditary or transfer anemia hypochromic anemia caused by divalent metal transporter mutation hereditary sideroblastic anemias there are hereditary thalassemias now absolute anemias we discussed due to decreased red cell production now the anemias due to increased red cell destruction that is the hemolytic anemia as we commonly call again we come over to the acquired causes and the hereditary causes the acquired causes are mechanical that is a macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia march hemoglobinuria artificial heart valves microangiopathic hemolytic anemia that is the dic ttp vasculitis and the many organisms parasites and organisms we commonly see in malaria uh, clostridium antibody mediated warm antibody mediated autoimmune disorder cold antibody mediated disorder transfusion reactions and the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria there is hypersplenism which leads to decreased red cell destruction now there is the red cell membrane disorders these are the acquired red cell membrane disorders per cell hemolysis acquired acanthocytosis chemical injury complex chemicals like arsenic copper and snake venoms this also leads to hemolytic anemias physical injury like heat oxygen radiation and the hereditary causes of hemolytic anemia the so the, now this hereditary causes can be if we start from the rbc it can be due to the membrane defect it can be enzyme defect or the defect can be intrinsic to the hemoglobin when the dis, in, defect is intrinsic to the hemoglobin it is the hemoglobinopathies that is the sickle cell disease the thalassemias the red cell membrane disorders are the hereditary spherocytosis elliptocytosis stomatocytosis and the enzyme defects are the most common we see the g6pd deficiency pyruvate kinase deficiency and there are many porphyrias which also comes under the hereditary uh, causes of the hemolytic anemia anemia can also occur due to excessive blood loss the blood loss can be acute or it can be due to splenic sequestration crisis now when i started i started off with the relative anemia that is when there is increased plasma volume which we have to be very careful so that can occur in pregnancy in athletes in astronauts when there is a rapid descent from high altitude to low altitude so this was all about the basic classification of anemia now we need to know about what is erythrocytosis it is a condition when there is increased red cell numbers when the rbc numbers are increased and it is reflected by hemo hematocrit percentage in in our uh, thing so hematocrit when the hematocrit percentage is above the normal limits of normal that is higher than 48% in women and 51% in men it is associated with general and specific effects and how does erythrocytosis generate its effect by changing the blood viscosity and the blood volume the blood becomes thick the viscosity of the blood increases logarithmic with increase in the hematocrit at hematocrits above the normal level the blood viscosity is impaired and this impairs the blood flow and the blood flow becomes very sluggish and there is increased cardiac workload and the resulting decrease in blood flow then it reduces the transport of oxygen also so the manifestation so i said the manifestations are the increased viscosity and the vascular spaces are responsible for the signs and symptoms of this erythrocytosis or the polycythemia vera the characteristic rubor that we see in patients with polycythemia is because of excessive deoxygenation of blood so there is slow transport of blood through the cutaneous dilated vessels it flows very sluggishly and there is excessive deoxygenation of blood and it leads to non specific symptoms like headache dizziness tinnitus a sense of fullness in the face and head it is all because of the combination of increased viscosity and there is vascular dilatation in cases of extreme increase in red cell mass in some specific cases of erythrocytosis cyanosis can occur because of greater amounts of deoxygenated hemoglobin there can be hemorrhage from the nose or stomach in the patients in whom platelets are normal the coagulation is normal but still there is hemorrhage this is also attributed to circulatory stagnation causing ischemia and there may be necrosis also thrombosis is also very common the coronary blood flow is assumed to be decreased because of the sluggish blood flow and there where there's an increase in the red cell mass so the risk of coronary thrombosis in patients with a high hematocrit leading is assumed to lead to thrombosis so how do we classify the erythrocytic disorders again it is relative and it is absolute relative erythrocytosis the red cell mass is normal but the plasma volume is decreased 
the and there is absolute the absolute is actually the red cell mass is above the normal so the relative or spurious when the red cell volume is normal occurs in dehydration excessive dehydration there is loss of plasma volume but the rbc but so we will see that the hematocrit is increased but this is not uh, the normal case this is the spurious erythrocytosis once we correct the dehydration this will become normal when the patients are taking diuretics also there is excessive fluid loss from the body smokers they will get spurious erythrocytosis and what is the true erythrocytosis that is a it can be it is primary erythrocytosis or it can be secondary so the primary again the causes can be acquired or it can be hereditary acquired is the polycythemia vera and the hereditary causes are the primary familial and congenital erythrocytosis and again the acquired causes of the secondary erythrocytosis are hypoxemia lung disease high altitude smoking carbon monoxide poisoning also there is autonomous erythropoietin production in many cancer cases like in hepatocellular carcinoma rcc cerebellar hemangioblastoma pheochromocytoma in these malignancies there is excessive of erythropoietin production which can leads to erythrocytosis so also an exogenous erythropoietin administration that is epo when we administer exogenously there can be erythrocytosis and there is some complex or uncertain etiology that is in post renal transplant patients we get erythrocytosis patients taking steroids we get erythrocytosis now secondary erythrocytosis due to hereditary causes so these are many hereditary disorders like there are disorders which have high oxygen affinity hemoglobins so they will not release hemoglobin uh, oxygen only 2-3 biphosphoglycerate deficiency, congenital meth hemoglobinemias. There is a very interesting disorder, disorder of hypoxia sensing. In, in these patients, they are, these are congenital disorders. They are not able to sense the hypoxia. So it is also mainly two types are recognized. One is the Schwarz erythrocytosis. It is a name that is a Schwarz erythrocytosis where there is a disorder in the sensing of the hypoxia. And also there is a disorder where the high uh, erythropoietin polycythemia is caused by mutation in the VHL gene that is the von Hippel Lindau gene. This is the cause other than the Schwarz mutation. So, thank you. This was a very basic and just the classification and the clinical manifestations. Hello. Oh, hello. Just one second, please. Yeah, that was very quick. Can you just stop sharing so I can see yes. you? Yeah, great. So as you rightly pointed out, this is a very basic uh, lecture, basically trying to introduce uh, the erythrocytic disorders yes, sir. To, to the whole thing. And uh, you know, went through the entire process, the classification, as well as how the manifestations are there. And then this follows up with the rest of the lectures, whereupon every aspect in detail. Yes, every aspect should be discussed. Yes. Yes. So, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kanika. I hope the students who see this, they will just be able to follow, and the presentation will be of help to them. Yeah, absolutely, it would be. Basically, just to give you give an idea exactly what yes. they should expect in the rest of the lectures. Yes. Sir. So that was so nice of you to, and uh, I hope you come back again. Yes, sir, definitely. Yeah. So we'll come back some some with more some more specific topic next time. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.